Part two of Chapter twenty of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Part two of Chapter twenty The Student Life. You would in this way escape the chilling and killing isolation of the early years, and amid congenial surroundings you could in time develop into that flower of our calling, the cultivated general practitioner. May this be the destiny of a large majority of you. Have no higher ambition. You cannot reach any better position in a community. The family doctor is the man behind the gun. Who does our effective work that his life is hard and exacting that he is underpaid and overworked that he has but little time for study and less for recreation these are the blows that may give finer temper to his steel and bring out the nobler elements in his character what lot or portion has the general practitioner in the student life not perhaps the fruitful heritage of judah or benjamin but he may make of it the goodly portion of ephraim a man with powers of observation well trained in the wards and with the strong natural propensity to which i have so often referred may live the ideal student life and even reach the higher levels of scholarship adams of bankery a little aberdeenshire village was not only a good practitioner and a skilful operator, but he was an excellent naturalist. This is by no means an unusual or remarkable combination, but Adams became, in addition, one of the great scholars of the profession. He had a perfect passion for the classics, and amid a very exacting practice, found time to read almost every Greek work which has come down to us from antiquity, except the ecclesiastical writers. He translated the works of Paulus Aegineta, the works of Hippocrates, and the works of Aretius, all of which are in the Sydenham Society's publications, monuments of the patient skill and erudition of a Scottish village doctor, an incentive to every one of us to make better use of our precious time. Given the sacred hunger and proper preliminary training, the student practitioner requires at least three things with which to stimulate and maintain his education. A notebook, a library, and a quinquennial brain dusting. I wish I had time to speak of the value of note-taking. You can do nothing as a student in practice without it. Carry a small notebook which will fit into your waistcoat pocket and never ask a new patient a question without notebook and pencil in hand. After the examination of a pneumonia case, two minutes will suffice to record the essentials in the daily progress. Routine and system, when once made a habit, facilitate work, and the busier you are, the more time you will have to make observations after examining a patient. Jot a comment at the end of the notes. Clear case. Case illustrating obscurity of symptoms. Error in diagnosis, etc. The making of observations may become the exercise of a jackdaw trick, like the craze which so many of us have to collect articles of all sorts. The study of the cases, the relation they bear to each other, and to the cases in literature, here comes in the difficulty. Begin early to make a threefold category. Clear cases, doubtful cases, mistakes. And learn to play the game fair. No self-deception, no shrinking from the truth, mercy and consideration for the other man, but none for yourself, upon whom you have to keep an incessant watch. You remember Lincoln's famous Mott about the impossibility of fooling all of the people all the time. It does not hold good 
for the individual who can fool himself to his heart's content all of the time. If necessary, be cruel. Use the knife and the cautery to cure the intumescence and moral necrosis which you will feel in the posterior parietal region, in Gaul and Spursheim's centre of self-esteem, where you will find a sore spot after you have made a mistake in diagnosis. It is only by getting your cases grouped in this way that you can make any real progress in your post-collegiate education. Only in this way can you gain wisdom with experience. It is a common error to think that the more a doctor sees, the greater his experience and the more he knows. No one ever drew a more skilful distinction than Coper in his oft-quoted lines, which I am never tired of repeating in a medical audience. Knowledge and wisdom, far from being one, have oft times no connection. Knowledge dwells in heads replete with thoughts of other men, wisdom in minds attentive to their own. Knowledge is proud that he has learned so much. Wisdom is humble that he knows no more. What we call sense or wisdom is knowledge ready for use, made effective, and bears the same relation to knowledge itself that bread does to wheat. The full knowledge of the parts of a steam engine and the theory of its action may be possessed by a man who could not be trusted to pull the lever to its throttle. It is only by collecting data and using them that you can get sense. One of the most delightful sayings of antiquity is the remark of Heracitus upon his predecessors that they had much knowledge but no sense which indicates that the noble old Ephesian had a keen appreciation of their difference. And the distinction, too, is well drawn by Tennyson in the oft-quoted line, Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Of the three well-stocked rooms which it should be, the ambition of every young doctor to have in his house, the library, the laboratory, and the nursery, books, balances, and bands. As he may not achieve all three, I would urge him to start at any rate with the books and the balances. A good weekly and a good monthly journal to begin with, and read them. Then, for a systematic course of study, supplement your college textbooks with the larger systems, Allbutt or Nothnagel, a system of surgery, and as your practice increases, make a habit of buying a few special monographs every year. Read with two objects. First, to acquaint yourself with the current knowledge on the subject and the steps by which it has been reached. And secondly, and more important, read to understand and analyze your cases. To this line of work we should direct the attention of the student before he leaves the medical school pointing in specific cases just where the best articles are to be found, sending him to the index catalogue, that marvellous storehouse, every page of which is interesting and the very titles instructive. Early learn to appreciate the differences between the descriptions of disease and the manifestations of that disease in an individual. The difference between the composite portrait and one of the component pictures. By exercise of a little judgment, you can collect at moderate cost a good working library. Try in the waiting years to get a clear idea of the history of medicine. Read Foster's Lectures on the History of Physiology. Bass's History of Medicine. Get the Master of Medicine series and subscribe to the library and historical journal. Every day, do some reading or work apart from your profession. I fully realize, no one more so, how absorbing is the profession of medicine. How applicable to it is what Michelangelo says. There are sciences which demand the whole of a man, without leaving the least portion of his spirit free for other distractions. 
but you will be a better man and not a worse practitioner for an avocation. I care not what it may be, gardening or farming, literature or history or bibliography, any one of which will bring you into contact with books. I wish that time permitted me to speak of the other two rooms, which are really of equal importance with the library, but which are more difficult to equip, though of coordinate value in the education of the head, the heart, and the hand. The third essential for the practitioner, as a student, is the quinquennial brain dusting, and this will often seem to him the hardest task to carry out. Every fifth year, back to the hospital, back to the laboratory, for renovation, rehabilitation, rejuvenation, reintegration, resuscitation, etc. Do not forget to take the notebooks with you, all the sheets in three separate bundles to work over. From the very start, begin to save for the trip. Deny yourself all luxuries for it. Shut up the room you meant for the nursery. Have the definite determination to get your education thoroughly well started. If you are successful, you may perhaps have enough saved at the end of three years to spend six weeks in special study, or in five years you may be able to spend six months. Hearken not to the voice of old Dr. Hayseed, who tells you it will ruin your prospects, and that he never heard of such a thing as a young man not yet five years in practice taking three months holiday to him it seems preposterous watch him wince when you say it is a speculation in the only gold mine which the physician should invest gray cortex what about the wife and babies if you have them leave them heavy as are your responsibilities to those nearest and dearest they are outweighed by the responsibilities to yourself to the profession and to the public like isophena the story of whose husband ardent earnest soul peace to his ashes i have told in the little sketch of an alabama student your wife will be glad to bear her share in the sacrifice you make with good health and good habits the end of the second lustrum should find you thoroughly established, all three rooms well furnished, a good stable, a good garden, no mining stock, but a life insurance, and perhaps a mortgage or two on neighbouring farms. Year by year you have dealt honestly with yourself. You have put faithfully the notes of each case into their proper places, and you will be gratified to find that though the doubtful cases and mistakes still make a rather formidable pile, it has grown relatively smaller. You literally own the countryside, as the expression is. All the serious and dubious cases come to you, and you have been so honest in the frank acknowledgement of your own mistakes, and so charitable in the contemplation of theirs, that neighbouring doctors, old and young, are glad to seek your advice. The work, which has been very heavy, is now lightened by a good assistant, one of your own students, who becomes in a year or so your partner. This is not an overdrawn picture, and it is one which may be seen in many places, except, I am sorry to say, in the particular as to the partner. This is the type of man we need in the country districts and the smaller towns. He is not a whit too good to look after the sick, not a whit too highly educated, impossible. And with an optimistic temperament and a good digestion, he is the very best product of our profession, and may do more to stop quackery and humbuggery inside and outside of the ranks than could a dozen prosecuting county attorneys. Nay, more, such a doctor may be a daily benediction in the community. A strong, sensible, whole-souled man, often living a life of great self-denial, and always of tender sympathy, worried neither by the vagaries of the well nor by the testy waywardness of the sick. 
and to him, if to any, may come, even when he knows it not, the true spiritual blessing, that blessing which maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. The danger in such a man's life comes with prosperity. He is safe in the hard-working day when he is climbing the hill, but once success is reached, with it come the temptations to which many succumb. Politics has been the ruin of many country doctors, and often of the very best, of just such a good fellow as he of whom I have been speaking. He is popular, he has a little money, and he, if anybody, can save the seat for the party. When the committee leaves you, take the offer under consideration, and if in the ten or twelve years you have kept on intimate terms with those friends of your student days, Montagna and Plutarch, you will know what answer to return. If you live in a large town, resist the temptation to open a sanatorium. It is not the work for a general practitioner, and there are risks that you may sacrifice your independence and much else besides. And thirdly, resist the temptation to move into a larger place, in a good agricultural district or in a small town, if you handle your resources aright, taking good care of your education, of your habits, and of your money, and devoting part of your energies to the support of the societies, etc., you may reach a position in the community of which any man may be proud. There are country practitioners among my friends with whom I would rather change places than with any in our ranks. Men whose stability of character and devotion to duty make one proud of the profession. Curiously enough, the student practitioner may find studiousness to be a stumbling block in his career. A bookish man may never succeed. Deep versed in books, he may not be able to use his knowledge to practical effect. Or, more likely, his failure is not because he has studied books much, but because he has not studied men more. He has never got over that shyness, that diffidence, against which I have warned you. I have known instances in which this malady was incurable. In others I have known a cure effected not by the public, but by the man's professional brethren, who, appreciating his work, have insisted upon utilizing his mental treasures. It is very hard to carry student habits into a large city practice. Only zeal, a fiery passion, keeps the flame alive, smothered as it is so apt to be by the dust and ashes of the daily routine. A man may be a good student who reads only the book of nature. Such a one I remember in the early days of my residence in Montreal, a man whose devotion to patience and whose kindness and skill quickly brought him an enormous practice, reading in his carriage and by lamplight at Lucina's bedside, he was able to keep well informed, but he had an insatiable desire to know the true inwardness of a disease, and it was in this way I came into contact with him. Hard pushed day and night, yet he was never too busy to spend a couple of hours with me, searching for data which had not been forthcoming during life, or helping to unravel the mysteries of a new disease, such as pernicious anemia. The student specialist has to walk warily, as with two advantages there are two great dangers against which he has constantly to be on guard. In the bewildering complexity of modern medicine, it is a relief to limit the work of a life to a comparatively narrow field, which can be thoroughly tilled. To many men, there is a feeling of great satisfaction in the mastery of a small department, particularly one in which technical skill is required. How much we have benefited from this concentration of effort in dermatology, laryngology, ophthalmology, and in gynecology. Then, as a rule, the specialist is a free man, with leisure, 
or, at any rate, with some leisure, not the slave of the public, with the incessant demands upon him of the general practitioner. He may live a more rational life, and has time to cultivate his mind, and he is able to devote himself to public interests and to the welfare of his professional brethren, on whose suffrages he so largely depends. How much we are indebted in the larger cities to the disinterested labours of this favoured class, the records of our libraries and medical societies bear witness. The dangers do not come to the strong man in a specialty, but to the weak brother who seeks in it an easier field in which specious garrulity and mechanical dexterity may take the place of solid knowledge. All goes well when the man is larger than his specialty and controls it, but when the specialty runs away with the man, there is disaster, and a topsy-turvy condition which, in every branch, has done incalculable injury. Next to the danger from small men is the serious risk of the loss of perspective in prolonged and concentrated effort in a narrow field. Against this there is but one safeguard, the cultivation of the sciences upon which the specialty is based. The student specialist may have a wide vision, no student wider, if he gets away from the mechanical side of the art and keeps in touch with the physiology and pathology upon which his art depends. More than any other of us, he needs the lessons of the laboratory and wide contact with men in other departments may serve to correct the inevitable tendency to a narrow and perverted vision in which the life of the ant hill is mistaken for the world at large of the student teacher every faculty affords examples in varying degrees it goes without saying that no man can teach successfully who is not at the same time a student routine killing routine saps the vitality of many who start with high aims and who for years strive with all their energies against the degeneration which it is so prone to entail in the smaller schools isolation the absence of congenial spirits working at the same subject favors stagnation and after a few years the fires of early enthusiasm no longer glow in the perfunctory lectures in many teachers the ever-increasing demands of practice leave less and less time for study and a first-class man may lose touch with his subject through no fault of his own but through an entanglement in outside affairs which he deeply regrets yet cannot control to his five natural senses the student teacher must add two more the sense of responsibility and the sense of proportion most of us start with a highly developed sense of the importance of the work and with a desire to live up to the responsibilities entrusted to us punctuality the class first always and at all times the best that a man has in him nothing less fresh energies and enthusiasm in dealing with dry details animated unselfish devotion to all alike tender consideration for his assistance these are some of the fruits of a keen sense of responsibility in a good teacher the sense of proportion is not so easy to acquire and much depends on the training and on the natural disposition there are men who never possess it to others it seems to come naturally in the most careful ones it needs constant cultivation nothing over much should be the motto of every teacher in my early days i came under the influence of an ideal student teacher the late palmer howard of montreal if you ask what manner of man he was read matthew arnold's noble tribute to his father in his well-known poem rugby chapel when young dr howard had chosen a path path to a clear purposed goal and he pursued it with unswerving devotion 
with him the study and the teaching of medicine were an absorbing passion the ardor of which neither the incessant and ever increasing demands upon his time nor the growing years could quench when i first as a senior student came into intimate contact with him in the summer of eighteen seventy one the problem of tuberculosis was under discussion stirred up by the epoch-making work of villamin and the radical views of nymeyer every lung lesion at the montreal general hospital had to be shown to him and i got my first-hand introduction to Laneck, to graves and to stokes and became familiar with their works no matter what the hour and it usually was after ten p m i was welcome with my bag and if wilkes and moxon virchow and rokitansky gave us no help there were the transactions of the pathological society and the big dictionnaire of de chambre an ideal teacher because a student ever alert to the new problems an indomitable energy enabled him in the midst of an exacting practice to maintain an ardent enthusiasm still to keep bright the fires which he had lighted in his youth since those days i have seen many teachers and i have had many colleagues but i have never known one in whom were more happily combined a stern sense of duty with the mental freshness of youth but as i speak from out the memory of the past there rises before me a shadowy group a long line of students whom i have taught and loved and who have died prematurely mentally morally or bodily to the successful we are willing and anxious to bring the tribute of praise but none so poor to give recognition to the failures from one cause or another perhaps because when not absorbed in the present my thoughts are chiefly in the past i have cherished the memory of many young men whom i have loved and lost io victis let us sometimes sing of the vanquished let us sometimes think of those who have fallen in the battle of life who have striven and failed who have failed even without the strife how many have i lost from the student band by mental death and from so many causes some still born from college others dead within the first year of infantile marasmus while mental rickets teething tabes and fits have carried off many of the most promising minds due to improper feeding within the first five fateful years scurvy and rickets head the mental mortality bills of students to the teacher nurse it is a sore disappointment to find at the end of ten years so few minds with the full stature of which the early days gave promise still so widespread is mental death that we scarcely comment upon it in our friends the real tragedy is the moral death which in different forms overtakes so many good fellows who fall away from the pure honorable and righteous service of minerva into the idolatry of bacchus of venus or of cirque against the background of the past these tragedies stand out lurid and dark and as the names and faces of my old boys recur some of them my special pride i shudder to think of the blighted hopes and wrecked lives and i force my memory back to those happy days when they were as you are now joyous and free from care and i think of them on the benches in the laboratories and in the wards and there i leave them less painful to dwell upon though associated with a more poignant grief is the fate of those whom physical death has snatched away in the bud or blossom of the student life these are among the tender memories of the teacher's life 
of which he does not often care to speak, feeling with Longfellow that the surest pledge of their remembrance is the silent homage of thoughts unspoken. As I look back, it seems now as if the best of us had died, that the brightest and the keenest had been taken, and the more commonplace among us had been spared. An old mother, a devoted sister, a loving brother, in some cases a broken-hearted wife, still pay the tribute of tears for the untimely ending of their high hopes. And in loving remembrance I would mingle mine with theirs. What a loss to our profession have been the deaths of such true disciples as Zimmerman of Toronto, of Jack Klein, and of R. L. MacDonnell of Montreal, of Fred Packard, and of Kirkbride of Philadelphia, of Livingood, of Lazier, of Oppenheimer, and of Oshner in Baltimore. Cut off with their leaves still in the green, to the inconsolable grief of their friends. To each one of you the practice of medicine will be very much as you make it. To one a worry, a care, a perpetus, annoyance, to another a daily joy, and a life of as much happiness and usefulness as can well fall to the lot of man. In the student spirit you can best fulfill the high mission of our noble calling. In his humility, conscious of weakness while seeking strength. In his confidence, knowing the power while recognizing the limitations of his art. In his pride, in the glorious heritage from which the greatest gifts to man have been derived and in his sure and certain hope that the future holds for us still richer blessings than the past. End of chapter 20 The Student Life Recording by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales